All right, our next presenter, Alex Metzger, is a PhD candidate and NSF Eigerd Fellow at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. He's working on a project using DSRP and sophisticated mapping techniques to better capture some complex social, ecological systems to improve some decision making processes involved with. So, we're almost there. Show him some love. I can't stop saying it. There he is. There you go. You click that one. Okay, great. Can people hear me? All right, excellent. Um, so, good afternoon again. And, um, you know, it's really awesome to be here. Uh, so I'm pretty new to systems thinking, honestly, and you know I'm kind of just dipping my toe in, but I feel like I'm in the right place. You know, we're, we're, a lot of us are talking about a lot of the same ideas, and so that kind of makes my job a little bit easier when I'm presenting you know, late in the afternoon, so it's going well. <laughs> um, so the title of my presentation is Transcending Boundaries with Systems Thinking. So I'm actually not going to talk about the modeling work that I've been doing so much, but uh, in about something we're trying to do to improve the tools that we use for decision making when we're, when we're talking about wicked problems. Um, so as Laura mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate um, in the School for the Environment at UMass Boston. And one of the things that um, us at the School for the Environment and people that I'm collaborating with around the world at this point are focusing on is wicked problems. So, you know, I'm not crazy about that term because I grew up in kind of New England, upstate New York area, and that's, that's slang for like cool or awesome. And so, so, but I can get over it because it kind of fits. These are problems that don't really, that don't really follow the rules, right? They're complex, they're interlinked, they're pervasive. And so they don't fit with the decision-making, you know, with the problem-solving um, strategies that we've had in the past in science of being, you know, reductionist and very disciplinary. And so, you know, it's time to kind of start developing new approaches that bring in, you know, a diversity of knowledge, that bring in diversity of, of um, diversity of different disciplines and diversity of mental models that go along with those. And so, um, you know, as we've talked about throughout the day, mental models are kind of each person's unique um, interpretation of the world and determines how they perceive things that they meet in their daily life and how they interact with the outside world around them. So to me, what this means is that there is a wealth of information out there for problem solving. And I'm very much of the mind that we need to uh, come up with a more democratic approach to scientific problem solving. So this means not just valuing the knowledge and perspectives of those people perceived as experts, you know, those in the ivory tower. You know, there's a lot of value in engaging with practitioners and with people who live and work and play in the systems that we're studying. So that's very much what I'm focused on. But one of the difficulties there is how do you take these very different mental models and try to integrate them into something that's useful? So um, one of the ways we can start to think about understanding this is through DSRP. So a, how does a person's mental model convey the distinctions that they make between things, the systems that they understand and the systems of systems that they exist in? the relationships they draw between the components in a system and, and how does that all kind of feed into their unique perspective and how do we integrate these things? So one of the tools that I've come across is boundary objects. So what is a boundary object? If this was a quiz, one appropriate answer would be chicken, right? So I say the word chicken, we all have enough of an understanding of what that means so we can talk about what a chicken is and what a chicken does. And then at the same time, it lets us it lets us discuss some of the nuance of the associations we have with chicken. So to one person, a chicken runs around and you know, it's a two-legged creature with wings. It runs around and it pecks at bugs on the ground. Another person might see a chicken on a platter, right? You put a little sea salt and rosemary under the skin, you rub some oil on top, and you've got something amazing, right? <laughs> so, so a boundary object is, is something that allows us to kind of um, allows an, an interface between mental models and, and it allows us to kind of negotiate, a, to socially negotiate a new meaning behind something, behind an idea. So a little bit more in practice, I was helping lead a workshop in rural Kenya about a year and a half ago. And um, we, we had kind of an unexpected boundary object that really brought things together. So we, we had a really diverse group, um, NGOs, government representatives, uh, farmers, um, women's rights advocates, and we we're all talking about landscape resilience. You know, what are the issues in your particular landscape? What are some of the possible solutions? And, and 
it was going great. We were throwing out a lot of ideas. There was a lot of knowledge being shared, but we were missing that kind of integration of that knowledge. And this changed once we put a map up in the front of the room. And all of a sudden we have, so, okay, one person comes up and says, here's, you know, here's a village up in the north that's having some, some particular gender issues. Somebody else comes up and says, oh, that, that resides within you know, the range of this pastoral group that I've, that I've studied in the past that, you know, that, that I'm associated with. And, and it kind of snowballed from there. Somebody else came up and said, here's a wetland nearby. And that's where a lot of, you know, that, that's where an important water source for some of these animals and for wildlife. And another person said, okay, now here are the ranching communities. Here are the fences they've built. You know, this is one of the barriers for all these animals getting to their water source. So it started to kind of integrate all that knowledge that was flying around in a way that was a little bit more tangible and more robust. And so immediately I was convinced, you know, we need to, we need to talk about boundary objects when we talk about solving complex problems. So the opportunity came to me when um, we came across this grant through the National Science Foundation uh, Social Ecological Synthesis Center, um, where I'm currently doing a student pursuit. And that's actually the project I'm going to be talking about instead of the modeling that I'm doing for my dissertation. But um, so our project was called Transcending Boundaries. We wanted to look at transboundary water agreements and say how, how are boundary objects being used and how would they be useful in, in these really complex negotiations about one of the most essential resources on Earth, the thing that people, you know, the, you know, the thing that people need to survive, the thing that people fight about the most, water, right? So the idea was that we were going to look at a range of management documents that were related to particular agreements in some of those places I listed, the Nile, the Columbia, the Ganges. And we were going to look at the management documents and look for visual elements within those management documents with the idea that those are serving, since that document is kind of an interface between people making decisions and people you know, trying to understand their place in those decisions, these are going to form boundary objects between those people. They're going to convey information and then they're going to engage the public with a discussion on, on what that information means. So we decided to use systems thinking, the DSRP framework, as a way to evaluate what types of information was, was contained in these, different, in these different visual boundary objects. So what distinctions is a map like this making? Right? What systems does it convey? What relationships? What is the perspective? What is the perspective of the person producing this? And so thinking of this as a way to kind of say, how are we currently using boundary objects? One of the outcomes that we, we were trying to put together is a typology of this is how we're using boundary objects now. And then how do we, and then beyond that, how do we use systems thinking as a way to build better boundary objects? To, to um, better represent the, the socially negotiated information that we have, that we want to convey, and, and, and how they kind of connect to the public and how they connect with other people's mental models. So systems thinking is a way to kind of understand that and improve it. So ideally, what we're hoping is to produce better tools. So boundary object as a tool, um, Boundary is, is a tool to kind of bring mental models together in a problem solving situation. Because if we're, if we're dealing with problems that don't necessarily play by the rules, then we need to kind of change our game, right? So thank you um, all very much for listening. And um, it's hard to talk in much detail in 10 minutes. So if anybody wants to talk more afterward, I'd be more than willing. Come see me. Thanks.